Okay, Jet Vance, Darrell Revis. Baby is off the board. The New York Jets select Bakai Beckton, Louisville. Fire up the New York Jets. Pressure just makes you go all the more. I kind of like pressure a little bit. The New York Jets select. Welcome to another edition of NFL Draft Preview presented by Verizon with the Athletics, Dane Brugler. Dane, it is one month away from the Thursday night of the NFL Draft. Round one, April 29th, we're recording March 29th, and you just put out a new top 100 list. The sun is shining. You haven't been outside in days, but how would you describe the biggest difference in your top 100 compared to the one that you put out, let's say, a couple months ago? Yeah, this is the first update I've made since January. Um, And so plenty of changes uh, when you factor in the Senior Bowl, uh, the the workouts that we've had. Uh, We finally have some exact measurements on these guys. Not that that mattered all that much, but, uh, you know, plenty of uh, plenty of movement. And, you know, you think of uh, back to the Senior Bowl, a guy like Quinn Miners, uh, the guard center from Wisconsin Whitewater, who didn't have a 2020 season. Then he shows out at the Senior Bowl. Uh, He goes from the sixth or seventh round. He comes in uh, at 56 overall on my updated top 100. So a guy that's right there in that late second round mix. Um, I I think maybe the most surprising thing about this top 100 were some of the positions. You look at wide receiver, 15 wide receivers in my top 100. And I tell you what, I was kicking myself for not including about five more guys in there because you could make a case it could have easily been 20. Uh, You look at offensive tackle. 12 offensive tackles uh, in this top 100. And that does not include, uh, you know, guys like Alex Leatherwood from Alabama, uh, Elijah Vera Tucker from USC, Galen Mayfield from Michigan, all possible tackles, but I graded them at guard. So we're talking a a lot of really quality offensive linemen in the top 100 this year. Uh, And and then even, you know, you look at pass rusher as well, corner, I think I had uh, 12 or 13, 13 corners in my top 100. And of those 13 corners, uh, 11 of them were in the top 62. So 11 corners possibly in the, in the first two rounds uh, is certainly notable. So uh, it, this is a, a top 100 that I'm sure might see a few tweaks between now uh, and uh, when the draft uh, officially starts here in one month. But I think this is a, a, a good – I think we have a good uh, idea of where a lot of these players are sitting at right now. And for the full list, be sure to check out The Athletic. Dane, you mentioned – the breakdown of positions, how many players of position X you have in your top 100. Now that free agency is somewhat in the rear view and we know what the jets have done, at least in the early couple waves of free agency, how do you think that the drafts strengths and weaknesses perhaps mirror up? Does it mirror up well or poorly with now? What are the jets perceived needs after free agency? And obviously the Jets were active in free agency and uh, addressing some of their key needs. Um, But at the same time, I would argue that I don't know that there was anything that the Jets did in free agency that's going to ultimately stop them from addressing that position uh, through the draft. Uh, You know, Carl Lawson was a great ad. That was probably my favorite move that the Jets made uh, over the last month. But I still think if the right pass rusher is there at 23, they could go that direction. Um, You know, wide receiver with Corey Davis – uh, added in the mix, maybe, you know, this is a deep wide receiver group. Instead of having to go wide receiver in the first two rounds, they could maybe wait third, fourth, fifth round and still get a quality player. So uh, you look at cornerback, cornerback, arguably uh, one of the top needs on this roster going into the draft. And that matches up well, uh, like I mentioned, 11 corners in the top two rounds in my rankings. Uh, so there almost assuredly will be a, a quality cornerback prospect available for them with one of their first three or four picks. And then last thing on the top 100, before we dive into one of the juiciest episodes, we got a seven round mock draft. You mentioned Quinn Miners being a big riser. How much rising and falling have there been this draft process compared to a normal draft process or pre-draft process that has a combine and pro days and scouts on the road. This year is very different. So heavily relying on pro days, how much rising and falling has there been from your two top 100s and who are some of the players outside of Quinn Miners that made that jump or slid down a little bit? A lot of a lot more fluctuation than usual because a lot of the information that we're gathering it, it's just late because uh, again you know guys you know it's these area scouts instead of being on the road and being able to uh, talk to trainers and talk to strength coaches and all the different assistants in person on campus 
uh, you know, they're having to do that during uh, via uh, Zoom and these virtual meetings, and they're not able to get as much information. So there's some background stuff, some character stuff, some injury stuff that is, uh, you know, kind of leaking out late, and we're still learning, playing catch up. You know, what's on the tape, we know. We have a good idea of the players. But in terms of how they're going to fit in, uh, you know, the culture of the NFL, uh, their character, things like that, that's still things that we're, you know, we're parsing through all that. And so because of that, there's going to be some late fluctuation, more so than we usually see, especially for those of us, uh, those of us on the outside who are, you know, we're, we're getting information from teams and uh, our sources uh, throughout the, throughout the league. So it, this year, more than normal, uh, we're going to see a little, a little bit more fluctuation up until the draft. We're usually towards the end of March, early April, we're pretty set this year, just a little bit different because of the pandemic and the challenges, but that's okay. You know, the goal is to get it right by draft day. And that's what the, that's what the goal will be, even though it might take a little bit longer uh, during this draft process. All right. I love it. And like I said, be sure to check out the full top 100 list on the athletic. Now it is seven round mock draft time. Dane, a lot of Jets fans, I think are going to be excited about the players you have selected for them. Are you ready? I will tee it up. If so, let's do it. All right. So I'll put it. I'm not going to put on my commissioner voice, but I will read it as if <laughs> you know, the, the picks were to be made. So the Jets of course have the number two overall selection and with that being said, in Dane's mock draft with the number two overall pick, the New York Jets select Zach Wilson, quarterback BYU. Why is he the right choice for the Jets in your eyes? Yeah, not much mystery at the top for me. Uh, you know, assuming Trevor Lawrence goes one uh, to the Jacksonville Jaguars, Zach Wilson's the guy at number two. Uh, and you know what? We don't know how Joe Douglas and Robert Sala exactly how they feel uh, about uh, drafting a quarterback in general or – you know, specifically Wilson, we'll have to see how about that. But I tell you what, the buzz around the league uh, is is all, you know, we're a month out and all the buzz is about Wilson going to. Uh, that's where the league thinks uh, this is going and uh, we'll have to see how it plays out. But it just, it makes a ton of sense. Obviously, the Jets haven't received high level quarterback play from the, uh, from the position uh, the last few years. Wilson is a very exciting talent. Watching him last fall, it became very clear that this guy is just different. The way the ball comes off his hand, uh, the natural accuracy, his ability to generate torque when off platform, uh, it's just really, really high level stuff. And are there question marks? Sure, just like any of these players. But if you're Joe Douglas and you have a chance to reset the quarterback depth chart, this is the type of player that you want to take that chance and see what you have. So Zach Wilson, the pick at number two uh, to the New York Jets. You mentioned the off platform throws we saw that in provo if you watch the pro day oh, especially that ever. one throw i mean i mean like look <laughs> whoever said it either it was either dj or Rhett lewis said it was the throw of the pro day season and a lot of people are going to say well you know he's wearing shorts and a t-shirt you can yeah. still learn things from a pro day you know i'm curious we mentioned his size before how do you think his his uh height and weight weighing in on his pro day did that help alleviate any concerns for you no, I mean, you could tell he bulked up. Uh, he, he looked a lot more cut than we've seen him in the past. So he, he's been putting in the time in the weight room. Um, and, you know, it looked functional. It wasn't like he was restricted out there with the added bulk. Uh, came in at just over 6'2", uh, 214 pounds, uh, nine and a half inch hands. So I think he hit the thresholds. You know, nothing alarming there. Uh, you know, we didn't think that he was 6'4", 245. You know, he came in right where we thought he would be. Uh, maybe a little bit uh, even better. So I think from a size perspective, you wish you were a little bit uh, bigger. He's a little narrow through it, through his trunk, through his core. But uh, uh, overall, the size, I, it's not going to stop you from drafting um, Zach Wilson. And that, that pro day was just a, a phenomenal performance. And yeah, it was against air. Uh, there wasn't all perfect. There were a few throws that maybe he missed uh, just a little bit off. But for the most part, it, it was a terrific showing. And you know, the pro days matter. If it didn't matter, these teams wouldn't go. Uh, especially it matters this year because, like we said before, uh, you know, teams haven't been able to be on campus, especially, you know, Joe Douglas. Uh, this is a chance for him to actually be there, see him in person. How does the ball come off his hand? Uh, you know, how is he interacting with his teammates? How is he communicating? All these factors matter when you're in person on campus and get to see with your own eyes. So pro days absolutely matter just a little bit more this year. And if you want a full breakdown of Zach Wilson, you got to listen to our quarterbacks episode that we recorded a few weeks ago. We addressed each of the top prospects at quarterback. And in terms of Wilson, I mean, we hit on 
the concerns with size, playing competition, the BYU schedule. I mean, we touched on it all. So if you want more information, be sure to check that out. But for this seven round mock draft, of course, one of the good things about this year for the Jets, not only do they have pick number two, they also have pick number 23. You have them selecting Greg Newsom, the cornerback out of Northwestern. Why is he the right fit for the Jets at pick 23? So far, I'm loving this scenario. Uh, two really good players, the first two picks, you know, get the quarterback at one, the corner at, at, at with your second first rounder. Uh, Newsom, you know, he led the Big Ten in passes defended last year with 10, uh, led the FBS in passer rating against, giving up only 10 completions. And of those 10 completions, only one was over 10 yards down the field. So uh, this guy is a route magnet, uh, attaches himself to receivers. He stays under control, excellent vision, excellent athleticism. Six foot, 192 pounds, uh, and he tore up his pro day. Four three eight in the in the 40 yard dash, 40 inch vertical. Really, when it comes down to Newsom, there are just two concerns that I have with him. He missed at least three games each of the last three years, so he doesn't have uh, you know the, the the most body armor on him. He's a little lean, doesn't have a ton of bulk, so the medicals be important just to make sure there's nothing lingering there. And then of his 25 passes defended in college. He only turned one into an interception. So uh, turning those, some of those, you know, getting his hands on the football is great, but turning some of those into turnovers will be important for him to take that next step. Uh, but again, you know, we're talking about a player with, uh, you know, tremendous talent and you're getting him outside the top 20. Love the value here with Newsom to the Jets. All right. Two part question here on Newsom. You mentioned the stats. That was part of my question is why is he a first round projected talent, even though the stats don't necessarily jump off the page and how do you think he fits into this Robert Sala Jeff Ulbrich defense we haven't seen it on the field but we assume it looks something from what maybe Seattle used to run with the Legion of Boom with a lot of cover three right and that's what we watching uh he played a lot of off at Northwestern uh Newsom so you know I, I think he'll be comfortable there uh he's very quick in his turn and run but he's also very quick in his downhill uh his pedal uh, and the way he can drive is really impressive. So quick feet. See a lot of Kyle Fuller uh, in him. So uh, I think that there's no question he'll translate well to the what they what they want to do on defense. Um, and, and then when you're talking about his resume, only one interception. Obviously, that's not ideal. You want to have a turn to have those turn them into turnovers. But he's getting his hands on the football, and you know he's not targeted very often. But when he was, he was able to create disruption. Uh, I mean, like I said. He led the FBS in passer rating against, which is, uh, you know, obviously a, a big deal. And leading the Big Ten in passes defense, even though he did miss three games this past year, that, that certainly stands out as well. So the Jets in this scenario have addressed the quarterback at number two, and then they go cornerback at 23. Then they flip right back at the top of the second round at pick 34, and you have them addressing the interior of the offensive line with Landon Dickerson. Yeah, this is a, another a pick that I just love for, for the Jets. Landon Dickerson is a first-round talent. Uh, probably uh, will be available in the second round because of his injury history. So that's the risk here is, you know, a guy that has been banged up in the past recently, uh, an ACL injury that he's coming off of. But at Alabama, he started 24 straight games. So it's not like he just couldn't stay on the field. Uh, he, he's equally effective at guard and center. Personally, I graded him higher at guard, but if you want to kick him in the center, I think he'd be dominant there as well. Moves really balanced, uh, protects gaps. He can climb, take out linebackers. He's got that genuine mauling attitude. So he uses those cinder blocks for hands, and he frustrates, and he finishes opponents. Basically, this just comes down to the medicals. If doctors tell me that, look, no long-term worries, uh, you know, he's okay right now, he should, you know, ha have a very productive career, uh, there's nothing lingering that should be an issue, I'm jumping at the chance to add Dickerson to my roster uh, if I could get him in the second round. The competitive makeup, the guard center flexibility, that's exactly what I'm looking to add to my locker room and add to my offense to help protect my young quarterback. Okay, two-part question again. Landon Dickerson played at Florida State, then transferred to Alabama. Where has he played throughout his collegiate career up front? And second of all, if you were to pair him with the Jets, like you do in this scenario, you put him right next to Makai Becton and have a Makai Becton, Landon Dickerson, left side of your offensive line. Is that what you would do? 
Yeah, yeah. I, personally, I like him best at guard, but you know he played a lot of games at center. He actually started. He ha, he has at least one start at every single position. Uh, he has one start at left tackle, one start at right tackle, uh, eleven starts at right guard, four starts at left guard, and then twenty starts at offensive center. So this guy has thirty-seven starts under his belt uh, across every single position, which is really impressive. I like him. I, I you know when you look at his size, six five and a half, three hundred thirty-three pounds. I like him best at guard. You don't see a lot of centers that size, but he could do it and be dominant. So, yeah, I'm plugging him in at left guard. You have Mekhi Becton and Landon Dickerson, uh, your left side of your line. Whew, I, good luck. You're going to run behind that line, that side of the line all day long. You're going to feel good if you're Zach Wilson protecting your blind side. I just I love that combination for the Jets. And how would Landon Dickerson do last point on him? The Jets – we assume are running an outside zone scheme. Do you think he has the fluidity and the movement to be able to execute that? Yeah, I do. I mean, obviously he's, he's a big brawny guy who is powerful and, you know, he, he meets rushers with a ton of force, but he's also, you know, he, he's a good athlete by NFL standards. He has the quickness that you need, the flexibility. He can get the job done. He can climb up to the linebacker level. And he's very intelligent, very alert. So I think that helps bridge the gap as well, where he might not be the best athlete um, among the offensive linemen, but because he's so smart and he's, he understands what the defense is trying to do, that gives him a little bit of a head start as well. All right, so, so far, I, I think a lot of Jets fans would very much like your mock draft scenario with Zach Wilson, Greg Newsom. And now Landon Dickerson in the fold. Now the Jets have two picks in the third round. And with their first pick, their original pick, they go to the defensive side of the ball and they add Ronnie Perkins, the edge rusher out of Oklahoma. And I like this, you know, a guy that can learn uh, behind Carl Lawson, uh, you know, Perkins is a pass rusher who is still learning, still growing. That's why he's available here in the third round. But there's a ton of talent there. Uh, in six games last year, he had 10 and a half tackles for loss five and a half sacks, 6'3", 253 pounds, 33-inch arms, and he uses that length and, and the heavy hands to attack the chest of blockers. I mean, and that's exactly what Carl Lawson does. Uh, you know, use uh, some stick moves, some stab moves. He keeps distance between him and blockers. Uh, and I think he benefited a little bit from that Oklahoma slanting attack. Uh, so he needs to continue and, you know, develop his arsenal of moves. But the balanced movements that he, that he has, the power – that allows him to stack, shed, get to the quarterback. Uh, the defensive coordinator, Norman Alex Grinch, called, called him the leader of the defense when he was at Oklahoma. So we know that's going to matter to NFL teams. Uh, I think he's just a, he's an ascending talent who would be a good value pick in the early third. And then late in the third with the Seahawks original pick, that is now the Jets. You have the Jets drafting Deontay Smith, the tackle, the tackle out of East Carolina. And you told me earlier in our recordings that – he was one of your favorite smaller school players, maybe someone that wasn't on the radar a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So why is he the right pick for the Jets in the third round? Well, and I think when you look at it, George Fant current, currently penciled in at right tackle uh, for the 2021 season. Uh, so they can, Jets can target a player here who doesn't necessarily need to see the field right away. And I think that fits with Deontay Smith because he is has so much talent, just needs a little more seasoning. 6'5", 294 pounds. You want to see him be around that 300 mark. We'll see what he weighs in at his pro day, which actually happens this week. Uh, but 35 and a quarter inch arms, light footed. He moves with bounce, with body twitch. Uh, needs to sharpen his technique a little bit, but the coachable tools are what you're betting on here. Eat, length, flexibility. They're outstanding building blocks for an offensive lineman. And he's a former high school wrestler. So, you know, you, you, he has that pedigree as well. Uh, he was a left tackle in college, but he also played inside at guard a little bit. They gave him the chance to work inside at guard a little bit at the senior bowl as well during practice, and he looked outstanding there. So, uh, you know, you're going to bet on projectable traits, and I, I think Smith has a lot of what you're looking for at offensive tackle, a guy you can groom and, to be your eventual starter at right tackle. Could he be a day one inside player, though? I think he could compete for that job. Yeah, I do. Uh, with the way he handled himself at the senior bowl, I think he's a guy that you throw in the mix and say, go win a job, rookie. And if you do, then great. If he's if he doesn't, then, you know, I think you continue to work on him and he'll, he'll be a starter eventually. But, uh, yeah, it would not shock me at all if you gave him the chance, uh, if he would make it close and compete for a job. All right, and then let's head to the backfield. The stable gets 
another body in the fourth round in UNC's Michael Carter. Yeah, give the backfield a little bit of juice uh, with Michael Carter. He's a he's a problem solving back. You look at his vision, his feel, his lateral agility. He can shake defenders. He can stack cuts. Uh, he's built low to the ground, and so he's quick to read. And you know, because of his size, that creates a lot of off balance tackle attempts. Uh, and on top of his running skills, excellent pass catcher, holds up in pass protection. Like I said, not the biggest guy, 5'8", 202 pounds. But he uses that to his advantage. And so I see a lot of, uh, you know, Dalvin Cook. He's not as big as Dalvin Cook, not as dynamic as Dalvin Cook. Uh, so a poor man's version of Dalvin Cook, and you see that ability. I would really like to, you know, add him into that backfield with, you know, LaMichael P. Ryan and Tevin Coleman. I think you've got a, another guy who's going to be able to take some carries, uh, be creative, and make some plays. So with a guy like Carter, what would Jets fans be able to expect from day one from a player that's selected in the fourth round? And how's his speed? Because if the Jets want to run this one cut zone outside zone scheme, do you think he fits that well? I mean, I think so. He's not the fastest guy out there. He's a, a four five type of back. Um, he's not a four three guy, but when you talk about, you know, outside zone speed is important, but so is vision because you have to be able to see the, uh, uh, see the the holes developing, and then hit him with timing. And that's what he does at a high level. He's very, very good at understanding angles and having a feel for what the defense is doing, their pursuit angles, and he can stop, create, and, and make guys miss. And so I think he'd be a, a really natural fit there. And what he could do out of the backfield, both as a blocker and as a pass catcher, that's going to matter. That's going to help him get on the field pretty early. Uh, you know, I think there's a good chance we see the Jets do more of a, you know, backfield by committee type approach. And if they do, I, Carter, I think, is going to, you know, at some point in his rookie year, earn an equal share of, of the targets and the carries that they are dishing out in that backfield. All right. So we're through four rounds. The Jets have two fifth round picks. And with the first pick, you have them selecting a Michigan linebacker, Cameron McGrone. Another really talented player coming off an injury. Um, that's why he's available here in the fifth. Uh, but, you know, at this point in the draft, I think you can feel comfortable rolling the dice. McGrone, he took over for Devin Bush as Michigan's starting Mike linebacker two years ago. And he looked like a future top 100 pick until his knee injury uh, this past year. But as long as the medicals are okay and the doctors say, yeah, he's recovering nicely, should be full go uh, by the time training camp gets here. I think he's worth the risk. Terrific athlete. Uh, he has the instincts where he can unlock and go, make plays all over the field. He needs to get a little bit stronger in terms of his uh, his take on skills and uh, you know getting on field reps on defense. But regardless, this is a guy who's going to be a key factor on special teams and give you solid depth on the defensive side of the ball. And in the fifth round, last year the Jets took a flyer on an injured player, Bryce Hall. Paid off pretty well for them their rookie season or his rookie season and for the Jets last season. So with McGrone, if he were fully healthy and he was on the path that he was, you you think he would have been selected in the top 100? And with that being said, is the fifth round about where you start seeing more of these value selections going with the discount stickers because of the injury concerns? And different teams look at it different ways, um, you know, because it all depends on what the medical staff says and how serious the injury is. Uh, you know, are, are they going to be ready by training camp or are they going to be ready by midseason? You know, all that factors in. Uh, but I think, yeah, fourth, fifth round is where, you know, you start to get some of the discounts on these guys. And it's it's a gamble uh, because not everyone responds the same way from these injuries. Um, you know, once you have an injury, you might be more likely to have that same injury. So, uh, there's all these risk factors involved, but when you're talking about the fifth round, uh, a guy that likely would have been a top 100 pick if healthy, because again, speed and instincts, he's young. Uh, he's only a true junior when he came out, um, you know, could have used another year at Michigan, but when you have speed and instincts, you know, th those are two qualities that, you know, you, you love at the linebacker position. So uh, in the fifth round, I, I think the value fits. And then the second fifth round selection for the Jets that, is was originally the Giants selection, and then the Jets and Giants made that trade for Leonard Williams last season. You have the Jets selecting Sean Davis to add to that safeties room. What does he bring to that unit? Well, last time the Jets drafted a safety from Florida, I think it worked out okay. Uh, they just franchised him and Marcus May. So, you know, they go back to Gainesville and they get Sean Davis, who uh, only average size, 5'11, 200 pounds. 
But he was the quarterback of that defense uh, for the Gators. Uh, he, he's able to cast a wide net. Uh, so he's able to make plays versus both, both the pass and the run. Uh, he has range. He has football IQ. And he's a former corner. So he has a natural feel in coverage. Uh, quick twitch athlete. Plays with urgency. So, you know, I think he could pl- compete for playing time as a free safety or a nickel. Um, and when you look at Marcus May, he's basically on a one-year deal uh, on that franchise tag. LaMarcus Joyner, a one-year deal. So I think they could use some safety depth. And I think Davis will give it to him, whether he stays at nickel, goes to free safety. I think he has the versatility to play a few different spots. So this draft started with a BYU quarterback. This mock draft is ending with a BYU receiver in Dax Milne. Why is he the right choice for the Jets in the sixth round? That's it. We'll bookend with BYU picks here. Uh, you know, he was Zach Wilson's favorite target in college. You know, Dax Milne's a, a wide receiver that six uh, one, one ninety three, uh, average speed four five six in the forty yard dash, but he's quicker than fast. Uh, vice grip for hands. Uh, he finishes catches. Tears up single coverage. He has that controlled quickness, that route leverage, so he can get open, create his own separation. Uh, last year for BYU, 74.3% of his catches resulted in a first down or touchdown, which is just a, a ridiculous percentage. You rarely see him drop a ball. He plays mistake-free football. He, he rarely misjudges a pass downfield. And he has a knack for just finding space. And that instilled chemistry between him and Wilson uh, is just an added perk. So I think he'd be the future slot receiver uh, for this offense. You know, you mentioned everything you just said sounds great about a receiver. Why is he a six round pick? Well, I mean, he is not the biggest guy. He is not the fastest guy. And so a lot of teams are looking for size. They're looking for speed. And Milne's not that guy. Um, it, you know, he's more of you're, you're quicker than fast. He's a little more controlled. You know, you think of like a Hunter Renfro, who, uh, you know, was a mid to late round pick of the Raiders a couple of years ago. Physically, not that most impressive guy, but, you know, he just produces. And so I think it's, it's a similar type of conversation. A guy that's not going to necessarily jump out physically, but he catches everything and he's got a knack for finding space. And you can absolutely use a guy like that um you know i think he steps in maybe your uh you know your fifth wide receiver and then he works his way up into the starting slot uh that, that's a realistic scenario for him all right so before we get to some fan questions just want to put a bow on the mock draft feels like based on everyone that you've pegged to the jets here that jets fans would be excited but how would you grade this mock draft that started with zach wilson the Jets add a corner and Greg Newsom. Then you go Landon Dickerson, who you said is a first round talent, but falls to the second round. Then even adding a guy like Ronnie Perkins. I mean, it feels like the Jets really hit the nail on the head in this mock draft scenario. So how would you assess the mock draft? If I was GM of the Jets uh, and you told me I could have this draft class, sign me up, done. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't need to see how the draft plays out. Give me this haul and I feel good. Now, with that said, there's plenty of risk involved here. You know, anytime you draft a quarterback high, it's always a risky proposition. So, you know, Zach Wilson's far from a sure thing. Am I excited about what Wilson can be in the NFL? Absolutely. Um, And then you look at a Landon Dickerson or Ronnie Perkins, uh, you know, guys that have missed time. Uh, There there is some risk involved with some of these players. But when you look at the talent, you look at the traits, uh, you look at at what the – if you make these draft picks, what you're banking on – I'm going to bet on those traits every single time. And if they don't work out, they don't work out. But at least I know that I'm betting on traits that usually translate and guys that have the right mentality, the toughness, the competitive nature that I want for my football team. So uh, I love the haul that the Jets are able to get here. And, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to see how it, how it pans out. You know, we'll, we'll see if they maybe move around a little bit. You know, there's, there's no guarantee that they stick with these picks here in terms of, you know, the, uh, you know, the number of the rounds where they're picking, uh, you know, they could move around, be aggressive if they see a player fall a little bit. Uh, but if they ended up with this haul, I think they'd have to be pretty happy. All right. So now let's hit some fan questions. I think Jets fans would be very excited about that mock draft. I was pretty excited about the mock draft, just going over it. So Max wants to know, this is a very topical question. What offer would Joe Douglas accept for him to not take Zach Wilson at pick number two right now, just to paint the picture, Zach Wilson's pro day last Friday in Provo, John Lynch and the 49ers who were in attendance trade up from 12 to three with the dolphins and all eyes are now, like you mentioned, Dane on the jets, do they take Zach Wilson? That seems to be the consensus thought, but what 
trade, what would a trade look like for Joe Douglas to consider moving out of that spot and let's say remain in the top 10? I think a lot of people have their eyes on the Carolina Panthers and the Denver Broncos. Well, you would think that uh, it would have to take a lot for the Jets to move out of there, especially if they like Wilson as much as we think they do. But, you know, at the end of the day, only Joe Douglas really knows that. Um, I, I, everybody has a price. Um, so, you know, if, if you're the Panthers and you're getting really desperate here and you're not loving the quarterback options that you think you're going to be left with and you want to go up and get Wilson, um, then, you know, I, I think you're talking about at least three first round picks, um, if not more. Um, and it, it's tough because we don't know what, you know, 2022 first round picks are going to look like. Uh, if you're the Carolina Panthers, you might be picking 18th next year. So, you know, a first round pick next year sounds great in theory, but it might be the 18th pick. It might be the 24th pick, which is not as appealing as a top 10 pick next year. So there is some risk there involved. I mean, it, it would be pretty shocking to see the Jets trade out of there. Um, you know, the fact that the Eagles traded back from six, um, you know, I think they kicked the tires a little bit on the possibility of moving up. Um, I don't think the Jets were interested. Um, I, I think just the buzz around the league, it just seems like teams aren't even interested in checking with the Jets to see what the price would be because they feel strongly the Jets are going to stay put and draft and, and likely draft a quarterback. All right. Well, let's move on to the next fan question. Bobby wants to know, out of these three players, who would you prefer at pick number 23? And for the sake of this argument, let's just assume that all three players are, are in fact, on the board, even though they could be selected earlier. Option number one, Travis Etienne. Option number two, Greg Newsom. Or option number three, Elijah Vera Tucker. Uh, I mean, I think we have to go Elijah Vera Tucker there. Um, I, I think I mean, he's my highest graded uh, of those players. Um, and Greg Newsom is the direction I went in the mock. But Vera Tucker is the higher rated player for me. And if I have a chance to get him at 23, I'm jumping at that opportunity. Uh, play both guard and tackle at USC. Um, and I think he's definitely a an NFL uh, guard. That's where his best position is. Um, just a really talented player. He's coordinated in pass protection. Um, he, he's very uh, under control. He's very uh, timely with his punch. Um, he does an excellent job staying centered. I mean, that's that's the biggest thing for me when you're watching offensive linemen. Are they able to stay centered with the with the defender they're going up against? And they they don't look like they're laboring when they're doing it. So you've got a guy here with balanced feet, strong hands. Uh, a very quick processor with how he how he sees the field and and uh, how he responds to it. So a, you know, there's no such thing as a safe pick in the NFL draft. But I think Vera Tucker is one of those guys that qualifies. You know, we just you feel like he has a high floor. You know what you're getting. NFL starting guard, plug and play uh, from day one. So if I could get him at 23, I'm, I'm jumping at that opportunity. I feel like a lot of people would be surprised if Vera Tucker were still on the board when the Jets were on the clock at 23, but. You presented the scenario, and in this scenario, he was available, and there's your answer, Elijah Vera Tucker. So final fan question here, Bobby wants to know, not Bobby, Michael wants to know, mm. what's better? You take the fourth or fifth corner at 23 because of a need, maybe like Newsom, Tyson Campbell, Eric Stokes, Elijah Molden, however you have them ranked, or take the best player available at linebacker or another pass rusher if somebody were to fall to 23 that you would expect would have been drafted before the Jets were on the clock? Well, I think it depends just, uh, you know, who, which corner is available and how closely rated do you have him to those other guys that are available? Um, if there's a big gap between your best available player and that next corner, then, you know, you don't, you don't reach, you don't reach on that, that corner because, you know, you feel good about drafting a corner, maybe in the second round at pick 34 um, or, you know, later on, uh, or, you, you know, you trade back from that spot. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the Jets are in a spot where there's a few positions they could go there. And, you know, instead of reaching on a corner, go pass rusher. Uh, if, if that's one of your highest rated players, uh, you know, could they go with another offensive lineman? We just talked about Elijah Vera Tucker. Uh, you know, could there be another offensive lineman there that, you know, you, but you can't go wrong going offensive line for this team, the way it's set up. Uh, you know, you're adding a quarterback, uh, presumably adding a quarterback into the mix. You want to keep them healthy. So, you know, I, I, you don't reach for a corner just because it is maybe, you know, what some per would perceive to be the top need, because I think there's a lot of different directions this team could go. And like we talked about at the top, 
corner is one of the deepest positions in this draft. Uh, you know, you're going to find one in the second round that you feel pretty good about. So, you know, in the first round with a top 25 pick, you want to get value there. You want to get talent. So I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards best player available at a position that I could still, you know, use on this roster, whether it's edge rusher, offensive line, one of those top tier positions. <sighs> Deep breath. The seven round mock draft is, it came, it went, it will come back for we'll our final one. episode <laughs> that leads up to the draft in one month. Well, less than a month yeah. at this point. So, I mean, that, that was a fun exercise. I love mock drafts. And I think like we yeah. talked about this mock draft, not only fills needs for the jets, but adds depth in positions. I mean, hold on. I have, I have it right in front of me here. I mean, the jets in theory beefed up their offensive line. They get a new corner in the first round, a new quarterback. They add to the defensive line with an edge rusher. They add to the running back room with Michael Carter. I mean, th mm -hmm. this draft overall, like you said, I feel like if Joe Douglas were to see that, he might say, you know, things might have went our way on April 29th and April 30th well, and May 1st. Mock drafts get a little bit of a, a bad rap, um, you know, because there's so many of them. And there, there are. Anybody could put together a mock draft. But you know who else does mock drafts? NFL teams. Because they – they try to plan out, okay, what's going to happen? You know, if you're the Jets sitting there at 23, you're absolutely looking at, okay, who are the, first, the five picks in front of us? Where do we see the Bears going? You know, where do we see the Dolphins going? Uh, you know, the Colts sitting there at 21. They have some of the same needs. They could go corner there. You know, you're, you're looking at all these different scenarios. So, you know, because that's what you want to do as a general manager, go through scenarios. That's all mock drafts are. You're looking at various realistic scenarios. So you're not surprised on draft day. You have a good feel for what's going to happen. So you understand your possibilities, whether that means you want to trade up, trade down, uh, whether you want to make sure you have an extra player or two available, uh, you know, on your board. So just in case you get wiped out. So mock drafts get a little bit of a bad rap, but NFL teams do them. So that's good enough for me. <laughs> and if it's good enough for Dane, it's good enough for me. And that's how we wrap up this edition of NFL Draft Preview presented by Verizon with the Athletics, Dane Brugler. Dane, thanks a lot for your seven-round mock draft, and we'll see you next week. All right. Thanks, Ethan.